Super. Thanks so much, Shen. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for everybody who decided to spend an hour with us today. I, I appreciate that as well. Um, so I'm going to share my slides with you um, and uh, we'll get started here. Hopefully this will work. All right. So as uh, Jen pointed out, um, I'm going to be talking about the role of strategy use in reading comprehension performance. Um, and this is some work that um, has been nicely funded by our internal grant system, which is one of the um, um, pieces that uh, we're expected to do a bit of presentation, and I'm happy to do so. Um, I started with an internal grant and then built it from there to a, to a short grant. Um, so there were a number of students on this project. Um, Catherine uh, and Taninder did some master's work out of this, um, and Angela was, uh, was critical in uh, um, the success of the project as well. So, one of the things I, I want to highlight is, although I've sort of titled this talk Predicting Reading Comprehension Performance in General, um, one of the ways I'm going to break this down is based on individuals' language experience. Um, and so one of the pieces I'd like to highlight um, is the fact that we live in a multicultural and multilingual uh, society, um, and that Statistics Canada in 2016 uh, pointed out that, uh, or, or found, I guess, that about a fifth or closing in on um, a fourth of individuals living in Canada currently have a home language other than English or French. And so when we think about our school systems, uh, we have a number of uh, individuals for whom their home language is something different than what they're being educated in. Um, and so it becomes really important for us to try to support all students in, in their success, uh, particularly with respect to reading comprehension, which is where my interests lie. Um, and so we know that students benefit from good reading comprehension skills. Um, they're critical for school success, but they're also critical for future careers and, and success uh, more broadly. Um, and so it's really critical for us to be thinking about how can we support all students. Uh, one of the things that we do know is that if you're exposed to two languages um, at once, you're dividing your time between those languages. Um, and if you're doing so um, in dividing your time, you're spending less time in each language. And therefore, it's not surprising um, that individuals who um, are learning English as a second language tend to have poor reading comprehension skills. Or another way of saying that is if you're an English monolingual, uh, you tend to have better English reading comprehension skills um, at overall. Uh, not necessarily, but overall. And so one of the things that we want to look at in this research is to better understand how we can support um, all readers with their reading comprehension, but in particular readers for whom English is their second language. So part of our way in, in terms of being able to do that um, is to think about what are some models of reading that we can draw on. And so this model has been around for quite a while. Um, this is the simple view of reading model. Um, and it was introduced, um, oh, 30, 35, 34 years ago. Um, but it really has served as um, a linchpin in our understanding of what constitutes successful reading comprehension. And so if we think about you know, what skills readers need to have in order to be successful, they need to have good word decoding skills. That is, they need to be able to look at a word and identify um, what that word sounds like. Right? Um, they also need to be able to understand the meaning of the word. So when they're reading it, they need to have good uh, vocabulary, they need to have good linguistic knowledge, um, they need to be able to do both in order to be able to understand what they, what they read. Um, it's not helpful if you don't know uh, the decoding system of language, and it's not helpful if you can decode but then are unable to um, understand what you've decoded. Right? So this is a simple perspective, but it gives us a good foundation. We can make the, the we can sort of add some dimension to this model by thinking about what are some of those underlying skills that are involved in reading. Um, and so here what I'm highlighting is um, word recognition broken down into phonological awareness. So an individual's ability to break down the sound structure of language, um, decoding, which is taking that um, sound information, that alphabetic principle, and being able to map it onto orthography or spelling. Um, so being able to know what sound an A makes and being able to use that to decode words. Um, and also being able to identify high frequency words um, by sight. So those, those familiar words. Uh, reading comprehension can be broken down into a number of pieces as well. Background knowledge, how familiar are you with the content that you're reading, um, your vocabulary, um, your knowledge about syntax and grammar, um, and your ability to make inferences. 
So in terms of that verbal reasoning piece. So all of these come together and are important for reading. Um, and one of the things you'll note in this particular model is this idea of how reading develops, right? So we can think about early readers as having some of these skills and starting to develop them. But as you become a more automatic and more strategic reader, you're better able to use all of these pieces in concert in a strategic manner to be able to uh, recognize what you're reading and to comprehend a text. Right? So all of these become important, um, but they're not everything. Right? They're not um, a whole laundry list. We can add more. And I think so that's what's sort of drawn me to this area of research is recognizing um, how multifaceted reading comprehension is. So here's some additional variables that we can add into our story here. Um, so working memory is important for reading comprehension. Executive functions, and what I mean by that is um, attention, ability to shift your attention from what's relevant and away from what's not as relevant. Um, ability to inhibit uh, information that's no longer relevant. Um, engagement and motivation, which um, we haven't, uh, which I really want to, whoop, we're flipping my consent here, let's flip back. Um, um, engagement and, and, and motivation here that we're, I'm not really going to talk about that much, but is also really important um, when we're thinking about whether or not people are going to be successful comprehenders. Um, inference ability, so um, being able to um, take a piece of information and um, figure out um, what a reader, uh, what uh, sorry, a writer, writer uh, meant when, when they when they wrote that piece of information, um, and reading strategies in general, which will be my focus today. So on the uh, right here, what you can see is several um, reading strategies and a poster that you might likely see on a classroom teacher's wall that talks about different reading strategies that, uh, that readers can, can make use of. So predicting, sort of thinking about what's going to happen next, visualizing, uh, creating that mental image, um, asking questions, making connections, etc. So these are all strategies that teachers often promote in their classrooms. Uh, one of the things I'm particularly interested um, that I'll be talking about today is which strategies um, are really connected or really used by individuals who show good comprehension of text. Um, is one strategy used more often than others? Um, how are they possibly used in concert with each other? Um, so those are those are types of, of questions that I'm interested in um, because we want to make sure that we're giving students good models of what effective reading looks like. Um, so what I've got for you over here is um, just a, a couple examples of papers that have identified effective strategies. Um, so Kate Kane has done a fair bit of re research, and here I'm highlighting one of her studies um, that has differentiated between individuals who um, are doing um, well in their comprehension and individuals who are struggling a little bit. Um, so one, one component where a skilled uh, reader differs from a reader who's struggling is in comprehension monitoring. And so what I mean there is this idea that you're able to identify um, when you understand something and when you don't, right? Because if you want to engage a strategy to correct um, a, or repair um, a comprehension failure, first you've got to recognize that you, that you haven't understood. Right, so if you want to reread something, if you want to move ahead in a text, if you want to um, perhaps ask for help, um, all of those are predicated on this idea that you're actually going to be, um, understand that, you've, that you don't understand. Um, making inferences, so um, again, sort of the ability to use those clues in the text to fill in some gaps. Um, one of the things to recognize is that when you read a text, um, a writer typically has many places where you have to infer meaning that isn't explicitly put in the text. Um, so an example that I like is just a simple uh, couple sentences where we might say, my mother went to the store, she bought some potatoes and leeks. Um, you have to infer that the she in those two sentences is my grandmother. So there's a number of, of ways where we infer where we might not even be um, as aware that we're making that inference, um, and yet we are. Um, the third one here is using text structure. So the idea that we know what type of text it is, is it a narrative, is it an expository text, what type of text are we being asked to read, and how does that help us in terms of creating um, a mental structure upon which we can then insert information as we move forward. So if you know that you're reading a story, then you might expect that it has typical features in terms of story structure. There's a, there's a main character who may be our protagonist, um, and a series of events are going to happen. 
as opposed to a text that might be more of a compare and contrast, in which case you recognize features that are associated with that type of text. Okay, so these are these are types of, of features where um, effective monolingual um, children have been shown to um, have a little bit more um, ability than individuals who are struggling. Um, one paper that I want to highlight from the bilingual domain um, was some work by him and his, and, um, his colleagues um, where they identified differences in terms of um, behaviors that skilled um, second language readers were, were using that um, less skilled readers were not. Um, and so they were relying more on background knowledge, so making that connection to background knowledge. They too were doing more comprehension monitoring and making inferences. And here there was a lot more questioning of the text, um, potentially because they were looking to compensate uh, less language knowledge as a possibility. Um, there was also more reference to vocabulary, but more attempts to resolve vocabulary um, knowledge. So if you didn't know what a word was, identifying that word and then taking steps to try to figure out what that vocabulary word meant. So these are, these are all sort of important strategies. What I'm interested in is looking at what types of strategies are seeing uh, readers use um, in terms of sort of relative use um, and thinking about whether or not these strategies can predict comprehension success above and beyond um, language measures. So I pointed out the simple view of reading and I talked about um, word reading ability, I talked about vocabulary, and what I'm interested in here is saying, okay, if we know this information about our readers, um, and we know that it predicts their, their success on reading comprehension, that's wonderful, but can we see more um, explanation uh, being accounted for um, with our reading strategies as well? So that's the goal here. So that takes me into um, the research questions that I've that we posed for this project. Um, so we're interested in um, does reading strategy use differ between monolingual children, bilingual children, and bilingual adults? Um, and so this is just sort of basically a, a count of how many times each strategy is used. Um, our second question is what variables, um, so reading strategies, um, word fluency vocabulary, are correlated with our comprehension measure for each group? Um, and then the other thing that we're interested in is which variables best predict reading comprehension success in each group. So are we seeing differences in what predicts um, performance? And so one of the things I'll highlight here is we do have three groups of individuals that we're looking at. Uh, monolingual children who are in grades four through six, bilingual children who are in the same grades, and then our bilingual adults, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, about in a minute. So what I'd like to highlight for you here um, is the tasks that we used um, in the particular uh, study. And the reason I want to talk about the tasks first is because um, it'll help us when we're comparing the characteristics of our groups uh, in a moment in terms of our participants. Um, so there were three measures that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, one measures vocabulary. So this is the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, um, it's a receptive vocabulary measure, which means we're really picking up on people's understanding as, as opposed to their um, expressive ability with vocabulary. Um, and so what participants would see here is four pictures. And so you can sort of see our four pictures here. They would hear a word, and they just had to click on the picture of the word that matches what they heard. Um, and what we did here is we took raw data instead of standardized data. And what I mean by that is it's just their total number that they got correct according to um, administration, um, according to the administration manual. And the, the reason that we did it that way is because we're not really interested in how they compare with other people of their age. And in fact, when you talk about bilingual individuals, it's hard to use uh, norms because the norms are based on monolinguals. So what we're really interested in is what's their overall vocabulary level given the, the set of items that we gave them. We also had them do the word reading efficiency. Um, and this has two different um, forms, or I guess forms, not two different versions. Uh, one version looks at reading real words. So you can see here as my examples uh, on my be warm, um, they would have to read as many words on a card as they could in 45 seconds. Um, and then we also had them do a, uh, non, a nonsense version. So this is a, a phonemic word reading task where the words obviously don't have any English meaning associated with them, um, but it's really to test individuals' ability to um, translate the orthography uh, or the spelling into um, how the word would sound. And what we did here is um, because these two were 
quite correlated with each other. Uh, we just added them together to get a total fluency score um, in this, in our approach was our approach here. Um, in terms of our reading comprehension measure, uh, we took some text from the GORT, um, and what we did was we asked them to read the stories two sentences at a time. So it was presented on a computer screen. They saw two sentences of a story. And then once they had read those two sentences, they hit a space bar. And when they hit the space bar, um, what would happen at that point um, is they would be cued with a beep to, to do a think aloud. So what we were interested in doing was understanding the type of information that they were drawing from the text and the type of behaviors that they were using to engage with the text. Um, and so they would, might read two, two sentences and have a question. And so they might say, I wonder this, or they might have a prediction about what's upcoming, um, or they might talk about the text structure. And so basically what we did was we transcribed uh, everything that they said and we coded it for whether or not they were uh, demonstrating any of these behaviors. And so what they did was they had four stories that they read and for each story there was four opportunities for them to tell us what they were thinking. Um, and then we coded those um, for um, strategy behavior. The other thing that they did was after every story that they read, they answered three questions. Um, and we really wanted to avoid um, concerns with multiple choice questions. So we gave them open-ended questions um, that targeted um, knowledge that was found in the text, but also knowledge that they needed to infer based on their understanding of the text. Um, so they were, had three stories after each um, sorry, three questions after each story, my apologies. Um, and when we scored those answers out of two. So zero if they really were very much off track, one if they gave a partial answer, and two if they gave a complete answer to the question. Okay. So here are our participants, and I, I apologize that the slide's a little bit busy. I, I did have uh, animation that I was hoping to make use of here. Um, so what you can see in terms of who our participants were, um, there we had um, part students in grades four, five, and six, and there was a total of 155 of them. Um, and so uh, within, the, within this group, 62 of them um, had parents who identified them as basically English uh, monolingual speakers. So these would be individuals for whom their home language was English and they were learning English um, in the school system here. Um, because they're grade four, five, and six, um, they were all required to take sort of mandatory French courses. But otherwise, they were English monolinguals. And you can see that their average year of English schooling is about um, 5.6 years, because we're, we're counting kindergarten in there. Um, so basically, on average, they're, they're sitting in grade five, right, because of uh, um, how we would get an average. Um, in terms of our um, English um, learner group, um, there was 93 of these students. Um, they were, on average, the same age as our monolingual English group, um, but they had years of English schooling. And what I would like to say about this group, which is very representative of the Canadian school system right now, is that there was a lot of variability in the group, right? So um, the way we identified, um, and I, I, I go back and forth about calling into these individuals bilinguals and versus English language learners, because um, a number of them would have been born in Canada, had a home language other than English, and had only ever been schooled in English. Um, and then because of our changing landscape here in Canada, there was also a subgroup of individuals who would have immigrated to Canada later, um, many of whom came as part of um, the refugee movement from Syria in the, in the last few years. Uh, their amount of English schooling would be less. So we've got a, a fair degree of variability here within our um, child bilingual group. The other um, group that we had um, was a group of adults. So these were 30, 38 um, adults, average age around 25, um, who were graduate students in the Faculty of Education, and most of whom were from the Teaching English as a Second Language program. Um, and they had, um, most of whom um, had come from China um, and had learned English starting at around eight, nine years old. Um, and we're learning English um, not in an immersion setting because they were in China, but they had come to Canada on average nine months ago and were doing an immersive program currently. And so one of the things that was our hope in collecting this group of uh, adults was that we wanted to have the opportunity to um, compare them to our bilingual children because we thought there might be areas where they were similar and areas where they were different. And in fact, we did find that. So if we look at our receptive vocabulary knowledge measure here, one of the things that you can see is that the monolingual children um, 
identify more words um, in English than both of our bilingual groups. And you would expect that, right? They've just got more English experience overall. If we look at the bilingual children, the bilingual adults, um, it was very fortuitous, actually, that we found that they really didn't differ significantly on the number of words that they identified. And you can imagine sort of the differences in their experience. The bilingual children have been immersed in English community for quite a while, many of for whom their whole lives. The bilingual adults certainly have more years associated with their English use, but it's much more um, a school based um, and, and less community based than the bilingual children would be. So here we don't see any difference. When you look at our word reading fluency, um, essentially what I did here was I added all of the words that they that they did. Um, they could have gotten a maximum score of 167, to, just to give you a sense. And actually, for vocabulary knowledge, a maximum score would have been 204. Uh, but keeping in mind that the vocabulary knowledge measure is intended for um, monolingual individuals and is intended to capture people well into adulthood. So um, the score for the monolingual children is well where you'd expect them to be given their age. Um, so but anyway, to, to go back to word reading fluency, no significant differences here. And in fact, there's been um, a number of studies that show that bilingual children um, are equally good to monolingual children um, in that decoding piece. And we see that here. What's particularly interesting to us, though, is that in terms of our word uh, reading comprehension score, um, as you might expect, the bilingual children don't score as well as the monolingual children. But we've got our bilingual adults who are scoring equivalently to our monolingual children. And so this may creates a really nice pattern of results because what it suggests is, despite the fact that our bilingual children have less vocabulary knowledge, they do have more reading um, um, experience. And so there must be something, or I, I'm inferring, that there has to be a reason that despite less language knowledge, they're still able to um, respond to questions um, to the same level as the monolingual children. That is, taking advantage of some strategies that they may accumulate having been readers um, um, for for the number of years they've been readers compared to our 10 year olds. Okay, so we're seeing sort of this nice pattern of similar results on reading comprehension um, that we can perhaps attribute some of our strategy differences to um, as we move forward. Okay. So I recognize that uh, this table is a little bit busy in terms of the um, what I've got going on here, but I will walk you through it. Um, so what we're interested in here is um, counting up the number of times each strategy was used. Um, and so what you can see here is all the different strategies that we coded for. So vocabulary simply means the number of times they made a reference to a vocabulary word while they were going through their think aloud. Text structure means that they identified it was a story or that they or that it was um, that they talked about sort of the author's voice, perhaps. Um, summarizing was that they gave us sort of a, an information nugget from the story. Uh, necessary inference, um, so the example I gave you before where um, they identified information that was inferred in the story, that was implied, and they articulated it. The difference between a necessary inference and an elaborative inference is that an, a necessary inference is required to understand the story. So if I said my grandmother went to the store, she bought some leeks and potatoes, you need to know that she is my grandmother, otherwise it doesn't make sense at all. But an elaborative inference might be um, with the potatoes and leeks, maybe she made some soup, right? So that's not something that you need to, to know to understand the story, but it might be something you infer based on her grocery list, okay? Um, questioning, visualization, all of these seem pretty, pretty clear, I think. Um, so what I have sort of circled here are areas where uh, we saw more um, uh, strategy use for particular groups versus others. So you can see, you know, the adults, despite the fact that they had less English knowledge really than the monolingual children, um, were articulating more strategies. Um, and in particular, if we look at our inferencing strategies, they were, they were making double the number of inferences, particularly for the necessary inferences, and more inferences for the elaborative inferences as well, um, in terms of what they were reporting. Um, they also um, made reference to text more often. Uh, one thing I'll note here, sorry, that I should have mentioned up front is, I've given you two metrics here. I've given you um, the mean and the median. Uh, the reason I did that was because the median tells us the middle score that's produced and the mean score tells us when we add them all together and we divide them by the number of people uh, what that average is. And what you can see is in some cases um, the mean score um, is inflated compared to the median and that's because there were some strategies that some people did quite quite a bit and other people didn't do very much at all. So our distribution um, is a little bit skewed for that reason. Um, it makes it a little bit challenging to talk about overall trends between groups. 
but it's really helpful when we have these uh, variability within the performance within the group to talk about how performing that behavior is either related or not related to comprehension. So it's a little bit of a advantage disadvantage scenario here. Um, but to get back to sort of what I was comparing here, the bilingual adults were also more inclined to make references to their background knowledge and also made more connecting statements. And so that connection piece is really important because the type of connecting they were doing was referring back to other parts of the text um, or they were referring back to other think alouds. So they were doing things that were allowing them to make links between uh, different pieces of knowledge within the text, which we assume is helping them create a better understanding of the text in general. Okay. Um, the, the other question we want to know is, well, were the, bilingual, were the children doing anything more than the adults were um, or each other? And what you'd actually see is that overall count for the individuals is pretty similar between the monolingual children and the bilingual children. There's not a lot of differences. The only differences that we're really seeing is that the bilingual children are doing slightly more uh, reference to vocabulary than the adults. Um, but what I'll have you note is the median score is zero for all of them. So what it means is that there's a few bilingual children who are doing a lot of reference to vocabulary. Um, and, so, and most children are doing none. So there's a subset who really are promoting that vocabulary piece. Um, with respect to predictions, um, we're finding that the bilingual children are engaging in more predictions than the, sorry, the monolingual children are engaging in more predictions than the bilingual children. So that's what we're seeing in terms of overall pattern. Uh, but what's particularly of interest to me beyond that is how do each of these behaviors relate then to their reading comprehension score, right? So what we're interested in is, um, if they, if they engage in more inferencing, was that related to better reading comprehension score? So here we go again, and I will say when this thing converted, uh, uh, when, when Collaborate converted, it, it shifted my slides a little bit here on me, um, but hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll work through it anyway. Um, so what I have here is all of the correlations between um, my, my variables, so age, language measures, and strategies, and what I'm correlating it with is reading comprehension score, so that score um, on how they did on those comprehension questions. And so what you can imagine is that age for the monolingual and bilingual children is, a cor is, is nicely correlated, right? So um, the older the kids were, uh, particularly the bilingual kids, the uh, better their comprehension scores were. Um, and that makes sense for the kids. For the adults, they were all around 25, so we wouldn't expect a correlation, and we don't see one. Uh, with respect to our language measures, we see uh, reasonably strong correlations really for um, vocabulary knowledge and word fluency totals um, for both uh, children's groups. Um, and for the adults, we only see it in vocabulary. And this is actually quite consistent with previous literature that finds that vocabulary um, is more important and that word fluency tends to uh, no longer correlate particularly well in adult readers. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, however, is look at the relationship between strategy and, and reading comprehension uh, while ignoring the impact of these language pieces. So I wanted to partial them out so that we could look at how vocabulary is related to um, reading comprehension when we take out the influence of language measures. So what I have here is the bivariate correlations, which tell us the relationship when these are included, and then I have the partial that show us the relationships when these are not included. And this is perhaps a, a better measure to understand the direct relationship between these strategies and reading comprehension, because we can imagine then that people with you know, higher vocabulary might also engage in more text structure, and that might explain the relationship between text structure and reading comprehension. And so if I partial those out, I have a cleaner picture of the relationship between strategies and reading comprehension. Um, so if you're if you're looking at where to focus, I'll focus you to these partial um, correlations. And what you can see here, just as a general glance, is that for the monolingual children, there are a few strategies that are correlated significantly. Um, and but when we start looking at the bilingual children and the bilingual adults, the correlations still are, are are maintained, and there's more um, strategies that seem to be correlated. Um, in terms of general patterns, one of the things that you can see is that across all groups, inferencing um, starts, well, except for this one variable here, uh, inferencing starts strongly and, and main, is maintained um, across the partial correlations. So we can see inferencing become, um, emerging as, a, as an important um, correlate of strong reading comprehension performance. Um, we can also see that um, for um, 
bilingual children, that we've got vocabulary coming out a little bit. So those few kids who were mentioning vocabulary tended to score a better on, on, um, on reading comprehension. Um, mentioning text structure, and we see that in both the adults and the bilingual children. Um, and then when we're looking at um, um, making connections as well, seems to be a pretty strong predictor. So one of the things I want to highlight here, and I'll highlight it again in a, in a minute or two, is that the, the behaviors here that seem to be correlating strongly with reading comprehension performance, so this inferencing behavior, this text structure, background knowledge connections, those are all of the behaviors that we were seeing the bilingual adults engage more in, right? So um, that's something to keep in mind in terms of what some of these behaviors are that either um, reflect good comprehension or, or produce good comprehension. We want to be careful. It's probably a reciprocal relationship. Okay. So then what we did was we looked um, to figure out which variables predict reading comprehension success well. And so one of the ways we did that was we combined our variables into super variables. And I thought for the ease of presentation here that I would just talk about what, what variables went into these super variables. So our significant predictors for the monolinguals here were vocabulary knowledge and word reading fluency um, in terms of our language measures. And that makes sense because those were strongly correlated um, with reading comprehension. In terms of reading strategies, elaborative inferencing and visualizing um, added more explanatory power. So we see that um, if the individuals were engaging in these behaviors, they tended to do better in our reading comprehension measure. Um, in terms of looking at my figure here, the closer these um, circles are to my regression line, the better able I was, the better my model was able to um, to predict um, their performance. Right, and so a lot of variance was accounted for here in the model. Uh, we can see 66% of variance was accounted for um, with this regression model. Um, but if you sort of have a, a take-home message here, it really is um, that we've got language measures that are that are feeding into this, but we also have a couple um, reading strategies. Compared to our monolinguals, here are our bilingual children. And so one of the things I want you to note right away is language knowledge and, and uh, sorry, vocabulary knowledge and word reading fluency are also significant predictors, just like with the monolingual kids. But here what we're getting is just more strategies um, are promoting better uh, or are related, I guess, to better reading comprehension performance. So the, the kids who are able to engage in the two types of inferencing, who are able to talk about the text structure, who are able to relate to background knowledge, to connect, the ones who are demonstrating those behaviors are the ones who are eventually doing better on our comprehension measures. Um, so it's interesting here to sort of see this in our bilingual children and not quite see it in our monolingual children. And in fact, one point I perhaps should have made a couple slides ago was there were a couple variables like text structure and connecting that were correlated with performance in the monolingual group. But those went away when we when we looked at when we took out age and um, language performance. And so um, it certainly might be a developmental trend that, that we're seeing here in terms of um, better language knowledge. Um, higher age might be related to those things. But when we start talking about the bilingual children, these really come back on board because these are things that, you know, are really potentially compensating for less vocabulary knowledge that we're seeing. So the ones who are doing a bit better here. Um, and the last group we have is our adult bilinguals. And as I pointed out before, we didn't see any correlation with word reading fluency. So we wouldn't really expect it to come out as a significant predictor here. Um, and again, we see a number of, of uh, predictors coming out for these adults. Um, so text structure, um, connecting, uh, these inferencing ones are similar to the adults, um, sorry, similar to the bilingual kids. Um, and we see a couple other ones coming on board. Uh, one point that I want to make about summarizing, just from looking at the looking at qualitatively at the data, is that summarizing was used differently by different groups. Um, particularly within the bilingual space. So bilingual children, if they were doing a lot of summarizing, it was a lot of repetition of the text, whereas bilingual adults, if they were doing summarizing, it's that they were identifying a piece of knowledge from the text and then using that to build an inference off of. Um, and so it was sort of a different use of summarizing between the two groups. Okay. So some take home ideas, and I think I'm doing pretty well here on time because uh, Jen told me about 40 minutes, so I think I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, in terms of some take home ideas, um, one of the things to recognize is that relative strategy use was um, similar across groups. So the groups mostly um, articulated inferences that they had made about the text. We see a lot of that behavior. 
um, both uh, necessary inferences and elaborative inferences, uh, followed by some summary statements. Um, what we saw overall was adults were just better um, or more inclined to speak longer and engage uh, and, and share uh, more about what they were thinking, uh, perhaps because they certainly had had more more to say and perhaps because they had more um, tools to draw on from their um, um, from the fact that they were reading in both of their languages. Right. So we saw we saw that in particular in terms of some, some of those strategies with respect to inferencing text structure. Uh, and whatnot. Um, reading comprehension success was correlated with both language measures and strategy use. I think one of the key sort of things to take away from that is that there's certainly a reciprocal relationship between um, your language knowledge and your ability to use strategies. You need to have a minimum amount of language knowledge to be a successful strategy user, um, but it is important to recognize that um, these strategies are accounting for unique variance in um, performance. Um, so it's not just a matter of if you have enough language knowledge, you'll be able to use these strategies effectively. Um, you, you do need to explicitly um, consider how you're using them. Um, we have some other data in our lab with um, adults for whom first, their first language is English, and we're asking them to read in English. And we see a lot of variability in how much they're actually relying on strategy use. And part of that may be due to how much they think they need to engage in strategy to retain text. Um, and what I'm getting at here is this difference between reading and understanding and reading and retaining information and encoding it for later use. Um, some readers, in terms of what we were seeing, um, were reading. Um, it was clear that they understood it, but they weren't necessarily articulating what they were what they were understanding through their think aloud. And then when they were asked comprehension questions, they couldn't remember um, what they were what they were thinking about the text. Um, in terms of reading strategy, um, and how it accounted for, for um, variance in comprehension, we saw differences across groups, right? There was some evidence for monolinguals that strategies were important, but they um, certainly accounted for more variance in our bilingual groups, um, where um, perhaps it was supporting uh, less language knowledge. In terms of implications for educators, um, one of the things that was surprising about this body of research that we've been conducting is how much or how little our readers are relying on certain strategies. Um, so for example, all the texts we had them read really would have allowed them to engage in visualizing or articulate about visualizing if they um, wanted to. Um, but we didn't really see very much of that behavior and we didn't see very much questioning either. And so we know from previous research that uh, teaching people how to use these strategies um, does lead to increased effectiveness and comprehension. Um, so here, what we're sort of interested in is these, these strategies were quite underreported um, and sort of trying to better understand why that was um, is something that we, we need to be thinking about um, in terms of what effective strategies um, individuals could have been using but weren't using that much. And in fact, we saw a couple places in the studies where visualizing um, was a marker of skilled comprehension, but it really was more of a marker. People were only using it once or twice, and so if they used it, it's almost sort of signaled, yes, I'm a good comprehender, but I'm not using it consistently, or I'm not, I'm not reporting it consistently. Um, since strategy use can account for reading comprehension success, ideally, um, it should be co-instructed with efforts to increase language proficiency. And of course, it's not to suggest that's not happening, um, but sometimes thinking about supporting students in reading things that are perhaps below their language level, but supporting them in um, engaging with, with, with strategy, reading strategies, uh, might be helpful because we're seeing the, the sort of this unique contribution um, of strategies. Um, and then the sort of final point that I wanted to make here was thinking about how to model these, uh, these strategies together effectively. So we saw, I've sort of been treating them as individual strategies, but certainly in the think alouds, people are using them together and understanding how they can be used together in meaningful ways really should support readers in creating a cohesive representation of the text. And I just wanna end by thanking the students and parents and teachers and schools who agreed to participate and the research assistants who really uh, made the project happen. And I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Deanna. If anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to use the chat window because I think everyone is muted, but uh, you can certainly use the chat function, uh, which you can pop out a little panel uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. 
Yes, I left lots of questions, opportunities for questions. And so, Jen, is it the case that they can't, uh, can, can they unmute if they want to? I haven't, uh, you can try. I've been trying to see if I can unmute people and I didn't find a way to do that, but. Okay, so I'm perfectly happy to have people to, to type in a question or if you want to put up your hand and ask a question orally, that's great. It's, uh, it was a little, uh, a little odd to, uh, okay. yeah. to make it my screen. <laughs> not see anybody yeah maybe i'll stop sharing too that might help a little bit i yeah i see you got a hand raised over here oh okay that's great um so yeah you can go ahead and answer your question there yeah ask the question please uh hi thank you very much for the, the presentation my name is kevin i'm a second year of PhD, i mean the phd student second year in applied linguistics uh, I forgot the presenter's name. Sorry, what was the, the I forgot the presenter's name. Sorry. Oh, my name's Sienna. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. So you have spoken about different significant, you know, uh, predictors in reading comprehension. I want to know that mm -hmm. how you consider um, because there were different groups. Like you know, you had just monolingual children. You had you had bilingual children and also uh, some adult learners, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, how about this exposure to the second language? How you know factors like exposure to the second language? We you definitely know that the you know bilingual uh, children are exposed to less second language than the monolingual or uh, level of confidence. You know because reading is a re really really hard task. Mm -hmm. or, or, and other predictors like these are two. The, the next one which I would like to mention is. Uh, general knowledge, because you were talking about the context, and as you know that if I don't have a context about the reading which I'm reading, mm -hmm. so that I would have lots of difficulties in reading. You know, I've been teaching, you know, courses like IELTS, ESL for years, and I've seen that mm -hmm. students who have knowledge about the topic or subject, so they will easily connect to the reading. How do you, how do you, you know, uh, take into account these kind of factors? Absolutely, that's a great question. And I, I think, you know, um, a number of things. Um, one of the things that we could, you know, do in future research is take a look at our questionnaire data a little bit more closely and delve into specifically more our children group, because that's definitely the group that has much more varied experience. Um, our monolingual group, you know, is pretty homogeneous with respect to their language experience and our adult group um, really sort of, um, although there's differences in their measures um, in, in terms of their vocabulary measures, their experiences are pretty similar. So it's the bilingual group really that um, would be a little bit more informative with respect to, for example, how many years of English have they had um, because it does differ as a function of um, whether or not they recently came to Canada or, or not. And I think, you know, that's sort of that reciprocal relationship that you're talking about between um, their, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there, um, reciprocal relationship between um, their absolute knowledge, which is what we measured here. So we'd like to think that their vocabulary knowledge, like their vocabulary in English is a good proxy for their language experience. So the individuals who scored particularly low on English vocabulary are likely also the individuals who have less English experience. One of the things I did do is um, uh, correlate um, their years in school um, to, in English to take a look to see if that correlated with um, their vocabulary. Um, and you think it would, but part of our issue is that we have a pretty large sample of bilinguals for whom they were born in Canada. And so that really does truncate um, our, vari our variability um, and minimize the correlations that we can take a look at. Um, but you're absolutely right, sort of a couple things there, um, looking more at their specific language backgrounds, particularly for that group, would be a nice direction for future research. Um, and the other piece in terms of background knowledge, um, one of the things we tried to do was make the texts um, reasonable for their level of, of um, schooling, particularly for the kids. But I do recognize that for the individuals coming from uh, particularly China, that some of the topics might have been less um, suited to their background knowledge. Uh, that being said, one of the stories um, was about um, farming, and there was actually a lot more response for the, from the adults about farming than there was from the kids. But it's certainly background information is certainly something to, to think about. Here we, we looked at 
the amount of time they referred to background knowledge, but if we had manipulated the relationship between their background knowledge and our text, maybe we would have found something else. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to be part of that research team if that's okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if we, if we, if we, depending on what directions we go, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? Thanks, Julianne. Appreciate that. As we're waiting for other questions, should they arise, I'll take the opportunity to uh, thank Jen for organizing this. Um, I'll also take the opportunity, if you're a faculty member, and I know you're aware of um, the research funding out there for you in terms of the internal funding that's there, uh, but if you're a student who's listening to the presentation, um, if you have ideas for, for research that you think would you know, require a little bit of funding that your supervisor doesn't quite have right now, but and they, have, they don't have internal grants right now, you might consider having a chat with them um, about whether or not you know, they could apply for an internal grant to support a project that you might want to collaborate on with them. Um, so you know, uh, having a discussion with your supervisor um, might be worth thinking about if there's a small research project that the faculty could, could, could support through, through your uh, supervisor. And I know those applications are due uh, October 1st, so thought I'd put a plug in there for each one. Well, if there are no more questions, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that people have uh, via email. If you have uh, questions you just like to ask me in, um, in private or if you have interest in, in the work I'm doing in general, uh, feel free to send me an email. Um, my contact information is on our website. And otherwise, I guess I'll thank people for joining me this afternoon. And I'll look forward to seeing people at the next faculty seminar uh, series presentation.